Colleen McDermott. I'm a professor of microbiology at UW Oshkosh, and my colleague Greg Kleinheinz and I are going to talk to you about our, the last three years of our lives that we're um, using C Wisconsin Sea Grant money to study Cladophora and its impact on beaches and the E. coli levels that we measure at beaches. So let's. You're all from Door County, so you probably, I think this is whitefish dunes, but um, maybe not. Uh, uh, I don't know. A good looking day at the beach, the water looks pleasant. This is the kind of, um, you know, scene that we would all love to experience on a July day. Are you going? Is this real? Uh, this is real, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to put down the shades. Okay. So is it tough to see? Yep. Okay. No, what happened? All right. There we go. But instead of that beautiful beach scene, sometimes when we go to the beach, we see this instead. And you probably all recognize the dreaded Cladophora. So this is the green, filamentous green algae, alga, called Cladophora. It's really beautiful when you look at it microscopically. But when it is growing out in its normal places, it would be submerged, growing attached to hard substrate, uh, rocks and so forth, out into some deeper water. When it detaches from those rocks, it floats up, and then by wave and wind action, moves into beaches, particularly where you have embayment, it'll stay. And then when that nice Cladophora mat, as we call it, um, sits on the beach, it begins to rot. And that's when the odor begins, that's when all of the unpleasantness associated with Cladophora starts to occur. Well, and again, you've, I think you know the location, but our study site was Door County, Wisconsin. Um, we used two beaches per year of our study. And as I said, this is a Wisconsin Sea Grant project, three-year program. Um, and we used whitefish dunes for all of the years of the program. And then we used either Lakeside Park in Jacksonport or Newport um, in Ellison Bay. And it depended on how much Cladophora was at Lakeside or Newport. We started with Lakeside um, in 2007. We used Lakeside in 2008 and 9. There was not much Cladophora at Lakeside Park, so we had to move to a new location. Our students would have preferred to stay at Lakeside because the, if you're sampling at Whitefish Dunes, getting to Lakeside for the next samples is much easier than finding your way all the way up to Newport. Um, so we tried to stay at one place, but nature did not allow this. So what about this organism? Unfortunately, today I will not be telling you how to get rid of it. Nobody knows that the answer to that question. We don't have any magic you know, crystal ball, so I can't tell you that. But we will be able to tell you some, how it impacts uh, beach water quality. So as I said, it grows on hard surfaces. When it detaches for whatever reason, it floats up and then moves into beach areas. And this was a big problem in the 1970s and prior to that. And then it appeared to go away for uh, 25 years. And now it's back with a vengeance. And people speculate about a variety of factors that have cause this resurgence of Cladophora. Um, phosphorus is always a player in this um, whole ecological system. Phosphorus is a required nutrient for all, almost all living organisms. Cladophora is no exception. Total phosphorus in Lake Michigan, 
has gone down over the years from the 1970s to the present. However, nearshore phosphorus has not. So there's enough phosphorus there to allow this organism to bloom and to grow profusely. Now, our friend, hmm, okay, we're here. The zebra mussel, or the quagga mussel, has, can have a role in this whole ecological system. Uh, what these organisms do, and you, you probably know, these are invasive mussels that have come into the, the Great Lakes, um, Lake Michigan, since about in, in the 90s. Um, they do a variety of things that allow Cladophora to grow better. One of those things is affect phosphorus concentrations. Um, through their filtering, they affect the levels of phosphorus in that nearshore water. The other thing and I suspect is the most important is their effect on light penetration into the lake. These mussels are filter feeders. They're going to be filtering a lot of water and clearing it of the particles that, are, that is in that water. That means more light penetrates deeper. That means that there's more places that this green algae, this green alga cladophora can grow. So you get more growth of the organism. Um, lower lake levels also probably contributes, again, because we can have Cladophora growing in places where it would not have grown if the lake was deeper and light would not penetrate. And then last, some people speculate some temperature may have a role. I find this a little bit um, hard to accept that with increased temperature we may get more of the organism. I, I think that's stretching it. I think light truly is the big player here. So. We've talked about Cladophora. Now we need to talk about beaches and beach health, beach water quality. We have been interested in beach water quality since 2003 when Wisconsin began implementing the Beach Act and our laboratories have been monitoring the beaches in Door County since then. So we're the ones that have our students out there um, testing beach water for E. coli concentrations for fecal contamination and putting up the closure or advisory signs. Um, e. coli has been chosen as the indicator of recent fecal contamination of the water. There are other organisms, but in Wisconsin and in the rest of the Great Lakes, E. coli has been chosen because it's in high numbers in feces and Whenever we then find E. coli in the water, we can say that there's fecal material here and that the associated pathogens, the disease-causing organisms, should be there as well. Those organisms like Salmonella and Shigella and Campylobacter all are the, the classic organisms that cause gastrointestinal illness. One of the reasons we've chosen E. coli, large concentration in feces, but also in the laboratory, it's pretty easy to measure. We can do some relatively simple microbiological tests that let us enumerate E. coli in water. Um, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, when we talk about E. coli, there are a couple thousand different strains of this organism. Most of them are not pathogenic. Most of them do not cause disease in anyone. There are a few strains that do, and those are the ones that you hear about in the news. Um, but most E. coli is not a pathogen. Most E. coli is totally harmless. Um, and by using them as an indicator of a recent fecal contamination, we're assuming that the organism does not replicate when it gets out in the environment. If fecal contamination of the water occurs, we measure it, and that's it. Those E. coli don't grow, don't become uh, more numerous. The uh, Environmental Protection Agency and the Wisconsin DNR decided that if we're going to measure E. coli, that we need to have some criteria for when a beach is going to be open or closed based on those numbers. So our open numbers are if we have less than 235 E. coli in 100 milliliters of water, uh, we call it a poor water quality advisory or we just say an advisory. If we're in this mid-range, 
235 to 999. And if we're 1,000 or greater, then we have a beach closure. So in every situation, we're, taught, we're thinking about what's the potential risk for in, in, uh, disease, infection, gastrointestinal disease, if you ingest water containing fecal organisms, fecal pathogens. So when we get over this level, then the, the risk for developing disease is high enough that we think no one should be swimming. In all cases, either advisories or closures, once the levels come down to these less than 235, we open the beach back up again. And in Door County, that's usually a one day close, the next day the levels are back down low enough. So what are the sources of these fecal contaminations? This is whitefish dunes, I can guarantee that. Um, well, people can be part of the contamination. That might be swimmers. Here's a little toddler in the water. Um, could be people or their pets. Could also be boaters. Um, discharge, not, that's not a boater. Uh, <laughs> I don't think. Uh, discharging. Um, from their tanks of their boats. You're not supposed to be able to do that, but it does happen. It could be um, septics, sewer overflows, and so forth. So humans could have a big impact on water quality. Um, domestic animals, agricultural animals, can also have an impact. Runoff from manure that's spread on fields can get into the waterways and cause problems in certain areas. Um, waterfowl can be the source of the fecal contamination. Here we've got a goose and a duck, but also gulls, um, cormorants, you know, whatever animal, whatever bird is on your beach, fecal material can be getting into the water and causing problems, or in some areas, other wildlife. And uh, we do some work on Lake Superior, and we've detected beaver, um, E. coli in the water, deer, and so on. So it really depends on where your beach is and what organism, what animal is around it. All right, well, what about this E. coli? We said it comes from the gut of an animal, one of those that we showed you, warm-blooded warm animals generally. And we're going to be measuring it in water because we're saying it's a recent fecal contamination. Well, a few things have come to the forefront recently, since 2003, that maybe E. coli isn't the best indicator of a recent fecal contamination because of some work that was done by uh, our friend Richard Whitman and our lab and a bunch of other labs that shows that E. coli, once it gets into the environment, if it gets to the right place, it may be able to survive. So sand has been investigated as a, a place where E. coli could rest and survive. And it looks like sand does a pretty good job of keeping E. coli alive. Um, this paper here that looked at sand and cladophora accumulations on beaches was a, a really interesting paper for us. And when we started to think about this, we said, mm, we should look at Cladophora. What does it do to E. coli? Can it harbor E. coli? Does it let it persist? What's the, the role of Cladophora in this whole beach quality um, scenario? So that first study by Whitman and et al. in 2003 showed that, yeah, E. coli is there in Cladophora mats and in pretty high levels. Um, this could be in the water underlying the mat, or it could be attached directly to the Cladophora uh, biomass. A little bit later, this uh, Eric Engelbert was, was one of our graduate students. Uh, we published a paper looking at Cladophora mats and trying to correlate it with beach closures or advisories in Door County. And we found at that point that it was not correlated. There could be a mat, but the beach could still be open because it was not affecting the quality of the water in the, at the beach. So this kind of left some questions. Do Cladophora mats really impact beach water quality? Do they raise E. coli levels in beach water? Which brought us then 
to our, well, I guess before we get there. Um, so how, does, how would this occur? We're talking about E. coli getting into the environment. We call that the, a secondary habitat. The primary habitat's the gut of whichever animal. So once it goes out and we have a fecal contamination into the environment, it's a battle for survival. E. coli doesn't have an easy time when it's out there in the environment. It has, in fact, a very low rate of survival. So it's, if it's leaving, I'm having a hard time with this. Leaving the host and going into the external environment, what happens? Well, there's low nutrients out there. If E. coli goes into Lake Michigan, it doesn't have a huge supply of nutrients to let it grow. There's also sunlight, and UV light will kill bacteria. So sunlight penetrating is going to have an effect and kill off E. coli. Uh, this whole variable temperature, pH, um, all sorts of things change constantly in Lake Michigan, and that's not good for E. coli cultures that are used to being in a gut that has the exact same temperature all the time and the same pH and all of the other factors very um, held constant. And in Lake Michigan or wherever, there's predation. There's things that are going to eat the E. coli so that it will not survive. And generally, this results in death of the organism and very little movement back to another mammalian host, very little disease. There we go. But what does Cladophora do when we go into this picture? All right, well, Cladophora is that mat that you saw, and it is providing a very stable environment for temperature, pH, and all of the other conditions. It's also providing a place where nutrients get trapped. So now we've got stable environment, we've got food for the E. coli. It blocks the UV light. So now E. coli is not being bombarded by sunlight. It's not being killed off. And it may or may not affect predation. It may protect E. coli from some predators, but again, it, and it, it may provide a place for other predators to lurk. So that one's a little bit questionable, but generally the end result then is E. coli sitting in the hammock having a nice time surviving nicely in Cladophora. But as I said, there was, it was more complicated than just Cladophora will survive. So this is where we did a little bit of preliminary work. And we did some sampling of Cladophora in Door County. So you see Murphy Park, Whitefish Dunes, et cetera. And then uh, Menominee Park Beach, which is in, on Lake Winnebago in Oshkosh. So we took Cladophora and we washed it so that any E. coli that was attached to the Cladophora would come off, and then we counted those E. coli. And you can see some very high levels per gram of Cladophora, tablespoon you know, of Cladophora. Remember the numbers that were um, letting us keep beaches open or closed? A thousand was a closure, and here we're talking about tens of thousands per gram of Cladophora attached. So we're, again, we're thinking we got to do some further studies. And this is when our Wisconsin Sea Grant was um, written and approved. And we began our study in 2007. We continued it in 2008 and in 2009. So this is, we've just finished this past um, fall, looking at all the data, and one of the requirements of the grant was that we do outreach, that we talk to the community, tell you what we found so that we disseminate our knowledge, you know, a, a key piece of all science. Um, this is whitefish dunes, and you can see Cladophora accumulating, not a ton, but it stretches all the way around here. And you can see some kayakers up here. On this particular day, I hope I don't offend anyone, but they were from Illinois. And um, they 
slodged right through this cladophora mat and they didn't seem to care about walking in it and they were just happy as clams that, for going right through it. Because a lot of people say to me, well, no one goes near cladophora mats and no one would swim near it. Why do you even care that it's there? And I said, well, ask these people right here about what they were doing in the cladophora mat. Um, with this grant, as I said, we looked at Whitefish Dunes, Lakeside, or Newport. Uh, we also had a, another beach as a, as a comparison, and this was a beach in Racine County. So a very different um, environment, a very urban setting versus a much more rural pastoral setting in Door County. But we did the same sampling techniques across all the beaches. We had two basic sampling techniques. One was, if you see this oval, this is the cladophora mat. And so we took uh, water samples and cladophora samples randomly in the mat. And we took some in the water to the left and some in the water to the right of the mat. Again, random grab samples. For all of the Door County beaches, left is north and right is south. We also did um, another sampling protocol where we took evenly spaced samples across the mat and then to the left and to the right of the mat as well. We sampled for three days in a row and we did this for three different events across each summer. So it would be nine sampling days per beach per summer. We had a variety of collaborators. So the UW Oshkosh group was Dr. Kleinheinz and myself and a limnologist, Dr. Pillsbury. And we had University of Minnesota colleague who was an Oshkosh undergraduate a long time ago, but he did some of the molecular work for us. Um, U.S. Geological Survey, we had um, Richard Whitman, who you saw did the original papers. He was, did, was our statistician working on some of the analysis of data. And then, as I said, we had a beach in Racine County, so Julie Kinzelman from Racine was also part of our project. Um, we looked at the spatial distribution of E. coli around cladophora mats and within the cladophora mats. And then we isolated some of those E. coli organisms and we did molecular analysis. We did DNA fingerprinting and Dr. Kleinheinz is going to show you some of the results from that. Kind of like CSI for microbes, we were going in to say what's the DNA profile of this one because we wanted to know when E. coli gets in the mat, does it replicate? Does it make clones of itself, exact copies of itself? Is it just getting more and more or do the numbers that we measure in there represent lots of different inputs? So we're back at Whitefish Dunes. You see this mat that doesn't look very pretty here. This oval is our, the mat proper for one of the sampling events. And these yellow flags um, marked off some of those equally distant spaced samples that we were taking. Oh, uh, this, was, this was bizarre. This was the first day of the first sampling event in the first year. And these mats, if you've ever been around them, as I said, are very odiferous. There's lots of bad smells, but they're really a fermenting bunch of biomass. And this was hot. The mat was steaming. We were there early in the morning at Whitefish Dunes, so there was steam coming off the mat. And if you stepped in it, the water was noticeably warmer in there. I mean, this was a, a, a fermentation fiasco going on. And so in this mat, there's not just that pretty green alga that we showed earlier, but lots of other organisms, including E. coli, maybe pathogenic gut organisms, and a lot of other things. And what was really cool was this is the true color of the water that we pulled from underneath this mat on that day. Purple, <laughs> like grape Kool-Aid. Um, and what we assume was happening is that there were certain kinds of 
bacteria that were releasing pigment into the water at that particular time. We saw it one, one more time, I think in 2008, but it was not, this was just a kind of a gee whiz thing for us. Okay, so what did we find? And I'm not going to show you lots of figures from all of the beaches for all of the days. I'm going to show you a few representative <coughs> figures. So what this is showing you on the, the y-axis here is the concentration of E. coli. And this happens to be log base 10. So those numbers that I showed you before that were in the 20,000s, we're talking about um, you know, a 2 log base 10 is 100, and a 3 is 1,000, and so forth. So across the x-axis, we have those marked off evenly spaced samples, 1 through 10 is within the mat, so we would take out water from underlying the mat. We'd have a little screen on the top. And then the A through J on both sides is within the water, just evenly spaced on both sides. Well, I think it doesn't take any uh, trained scientist to see that the water underlying the mat is far greater, has far greater concentrations of E. coli than do the, the, the uh, the water on either side of the mat, to the left or the right. 235 is that magic advisory number, so that's um, a 2.7. So if we drew a line right across here, that would be our advisory limit. So you could see to the north, we're, we're surpassing that a little. To the south, nah, we're right about at the advisory limit. Under the mat, we're thousands, a thousand or two, 10,000 times greater. Lots of E. coli in that water underlying the mat. Uh, this is the, some of those random samples. This was whitefish dunes, again, 2007. As I said, I just, we just pulled a few different ones. The green bars are that, is that water taken directly under the mat. The yellow bars are to the north, and the blue bars are to the south. And again, you can see that same pattern that I showed you before, very high under the mat, much lower to the north, and you know, almost you know, unde undetectable down here almost. But why we put this slide in is look at this is the first day, the second day, and the third day that we would sample in a row. What's happening to the E. coli under the mat as time goes on? It's getting higher and higher. It's increasing, which lends some credence to this idea that maybe E. coli is replicating in this Cladophora mat. It's not just surviving, but making more of itself while it's in, in that mat. Not only did we look at water, but we also took samples of Cladophora washed them. It requires you to shake the heck out of samples of Cladophora to try to get the E. coli to detach from these filaments. And this is lakeside, and this is whitefish dunes, and this is so we're going from the left to the right side of the mat in both cases, and these are the three different days of an event. It's hard to see these numbers, but this is 200,000, 250,000 E. coli per gram of Cladophora biomass. That's a lot of E. coli. To my eye, when you look at this, you say, it doesn't look like there's any real pattern, you know, between going from left to right. When you look at all of the data for the three years, it does turn out that, and I'll show you one more, that um, the Cladophora levels are higher in the center of the mat than on the edges, which kind of makes sense because wind and waves are going to be attacking the edges of the mat and kind of detaching Cladophora. In the center, it's all protected, so the amount of E. coli attached to the Cladophora in the center is higher. But this is uh, Newport Beach and Whitefish Dunes. I think this is 2008. And again, we're, these are log, so we're talking about 10,000 10, to 100,000 um, E. coli per gram of Cladophora. Here's 
and we have a statistician in our bunch, so he likes to make these scatter plots. Um, this is looking at the amount of E. coli that's in the water compared to the amount of E. coli that is attached to the Cladophora. And you can see that it's a positive correlation, a one-to-one -one kind of relationship. As there's more, uh, more E. coli attached to the Cladophora, more can break off and go into the water around and under the mat. And I'm going to turn it over now to Greg, and he's going to talk about the genetics and what you could do with that cladophora if you take it off the beach. Unless you want to leave it on your beach, <laughs> in which case you might want to live in Chicago. Anyway, um, so the genetic relatedness, I'm not going to go through all the details um, as Colleen pointed out, but what we'd like to do is sort of give you the high points and then talk about some of the things we looked at. Um, I'm very much into you know, looking at things scientifically. I'm a scientist, but on the other hand, I'm a very applied scientist. So I, I really believe that if we're going to spend all this time and money and effort in doing these things, um, we should be able to do something uh, with that data. And so hopefully we'll be able to point some people in the right direction and at least maybe tell you about some things that may be happening in the county um, as we move forward. So um, let, me, let me move forward just a little bit. I'll come back to this one in a second. I'm sort of a visual person. So <clears throat> this is, this is a, what's called a multi-dimensional scaling plot. But the, really the bottom line is every one of these little colored balls is an E. coli that we recovered out of those mats. And so as Colleen mentioned, we actually went in the mats, we recovered E. coli, and the question really was, um, people always say, well, what came first, the Cladophora or the E. coli, or you know, how does E. coli get in the Cladophora? Does the Cladophora wash up on the beach? And then there's, um, like that one study showed, there's E. coli in the sand. Does that E. coli in the sand come back out of the sand and then uh, repopulate the Cladophora and so forth? And so uh, we went and recovered lots of different E. coli isolates. Um, this one happens to be uh, from whitefish dunes, I believe. And so what we did is we went through a genetic analysis. I'm not going to bore you with that, but basically we look at the DNA. And so what kind of DNA profile is sort of like E. coli paternity testing. And uh, no, people always ask, well, can you tell which seagull it came from or something? Um, but we can't, although we did have students collecting seagull feces for many years. Um, so I'm, I'll come back to this. And what we wanted to do is look at 2007, 2008. Um, we don't have the 2009 data analyzed yet, um, at least as far as we're concerned. And so what we wanted to do is look at how similar things are. And I, this analysis is, is, is complicated, and I'm, really, I'm not really good at explaining it or really understand it completely, but the statistician people tell us it's really important. So if you look at the years, it's sort of like one of those uh, little games you play. So you get 2008 and 2008, and basically what you do is you take all these little balls, and if I took one red one out of the pile, what are the odds that it's going to go back into that same group? So what are the odds that it fits with its group? And so if you look at these numbers, basically almost 85% of the time, if you took a 2008 E. coli isolate out um, at Whitefish Dunes, it would go back into the group. And so that means that all that E. coli is really highly related. Um, and it really, if you want to compare that to 2008, you take one of those red balls out and you want to try and match it up with one from the year before, it really doesn't match up. So they don't match very well. Um, and again, if you look at 2007, it's the same sort of principle. Um, you know, you get a match of 55% using this technique, 95% almost with this technique. But the take-home message really is they, they match very well from year to year, indicating they're very homogeneous or kind of similar. Um, but when you compare them with another year, they're not very similar. And I, I'm, again, I'm sort of a visual guy, so I can say all the green balls are close together and all the red balls are close together. Um, and so what we wanted to do is look countywide, <clears throat> excuse me, and as Colleen mentioned, we, uh, we have Lakeside Park, uh, Newport, uh, Whitefish Dunes both years, and so how do those all relate? Again, I'm not going to go through all these numbers with you, but if you look at it again, E. coli in, in, uh, or Whitefish Dunes in 2007, very close to each other, Lakeside very close to each other, Newport again close to each other, and Whitefish in 08, and none of them really cross-linked. So again, each one of these, the genetics of the population of E. coli is very similar um, and this, and from year to year. So we know that, for example, 
the lakeside E. coli aren't sort of migrating north to Newport or south to Whitefish Dunes. They're pretty much there at Newport and, uh, and they're different from year to year, at least according to this data. Um, and then we looked at that three-day sampling event that Colleen showed, so we can break it down even further. And I, I have to do the little circles here, so bear with me with all my different colors. But this is a, a three-day event early in the year. This is a three-day event in the middle of the year, uh, early August, and this one's a little bit later uh, in August. And so if you look at those groups, even with those three days that uh, we saw before, there's very distinct populations in some cases where, you know, maybe, for example, Early on, you get uh, one source of E. coli, a gull. Maybe you get another source, a goose. Uh, maybe this is somebody's dog. I don't know. I'm just randomly picking those out. And so then all of a sudden, you have three distinct populations um, at each different event, but each event is very different from the previous one. And so an event occurred uh, when a map blew into the beach. When a map blew in, wind direction was right, the map blew in, the people came out and did this three-day sampling event, this event was over in three days, and most of the time the mats blew back out. So each one of these events represents completely different mats, indicating that the sources, even within the same season, may be a little bit different. <coughs> um, and here's another one again. This one is a little bit more like a shotgun uh, approach, but it's the same sort of thing. You can see purple groupings, green and yellow groupings, or... Uh, uh, green and red groupings, excuse me, and those are a little different. The, the yellow one's more spread out. Again, it's the same. It's a little bit different analysis, um, but again, telling us the same story, and it's really confirming what we saw with the numbers. And Racine, nobody usually cares about Racine, but uh, it, the reason I'm telling you, that I'm showing a little bit of this, is it tells us the same story. So this isn't any sort of Door, Com Door County phenomenon or anything. Um, the Racine data um, from our collaborator showed us um, the same thing, and she had less isolates, um, but again, you know, we see them grouping uh, by color and showing us the same sort of thing. And what is the take home message here? Um, it tells us that the results from these things that uh, E. coli is, is really related only to itself within uh, particular seasons. Um, there's no E. coli in the winter. We've went uh, <laughs> sampling in the winter. That's always a good time. Um, and drilled holes in the ice and pulled uh, E. coli from either beach water or beach sand. We really don't find any. Um, but then in the spring, we see the e, e. coli reappearing. And that means that the E. coli is really not overwintering or something in your sand. And then in the spring, when the cladophora rolls in, it's just all of a sudden resurrected out of the sand um, and, uh, and reproduces in your cladophora mat and starts causing problems. It's really something local and it's seasonal. So, I mean, really, if you think about it, what's around the cladophora mat? I mean, seagulls, coumarants, gulls, or I mean, goose, uh, geese, depending on which beach you're at. Um, and so something's happening locally. And if, we, if you bear with me for a second, whoops, not if I go the right direction. And if I go back to one of the figures Colleen showed, this figure, um, this will be important in a minute because if you look at this, this is the first day of an event, this is the second day of an event, and the third day. And so what this tells us is um, as that mat sits on your beach, it actually increases the amount of E. coli. The E. coli is able to replicate within that mat. If you look to the left of the mat, here and here, again, that increase goes from 21 almost up to 1,100, 1,200 to 1,800. Again, there's 14 to the right of the mat. This is actually the swimming area at Whitefish Dunes to 21 up to uh, 328, which is a beach advisory. So we see the longer the mat sits there, the greater the amount of E. coli. And then when we go back to this genetic data, we see that over time, these genetic uh, characteristics of the E. coli we're recovering um, indicate, again, they sort of confirm that same data that we're finding, that the E. coli is very homogeneous and very similar, and probably that means it comes from the same sort of parent E. coli, if you want to think about it. Um, that way. So, I mean, all the data really supported itself um, in terms of how much E. coli was there. And then the, really the crux of the, the, the take-home message here is um, that sand and water and, and other things really don't contribute tremendous amounts. They may harbor it, but it's really a seasonal phenomenon. And that brought us sort of to the next part of what I want to talk about is we know the E. coli, or the E. coli, the, well, E. coli is bad too. The Clodophora stinks. I mean, we've been out there in the morning. You probably have all seen this. It's sort of steaming and 
Um, it, it's odorous and it doesn't look nice. And um, so there's the aesthetic problems, but there's also the, the things that we just mentioned in terms of the E. coli problems, and we know that there's lots of that. We then also looked at pathogens. So that most of the E. coli, as Colleen mentioned, aren't really things that are making you sick. They just indicate that there might be things that are there that are making you sick. Um, so we looked at uh, Salmonella, Shigella, and Campylobacter, and we really didn't see any. There was very few times that we found it. Um, there was a Salmonella recovered here in August 6 of 2008, um, and a few Campylobacters, and that was about it. Um, and so in Racine, again, they found a little bit of Salmonella, um, but really not much. So when you look at the great numbers of E. coli, they were smaller numbers of the pathogens we think of as being suspects of the things that make us sick. Now, is that all the pathogens? No, there's clearly things like um, the Cryptosporidium or Girardia, the pro, uh, protozoans that we think about. Um, there's viruses. Um, it doesn't include any of those, but these are sort of things that you can culture in a lab that are, are fairly straightforward. And so um, we then went to look at, there's some molecular methods just to try it out and see. But really the take home message again is, uh, there's lots of E. coli, and E. coli may be replicating, and that maybe looks really bad, but maybe the pathogens aren't sort of following suit um, and, uh, and replicating as well. So then that led us to, you know, we need to get the Clodophora off the beach. I don't know, maybe, maybe you like it um, if, at, at your beach. Uh, most people don't. One of, the, one of my best stories was telling a, an engineering company uh, that was working in the county about the Clodophora issue and how much of a problem it was. And we were up at uh, Bailey's Harbor, and uh, they said, oh, well, can we see the Clodophora? And I mean, there's always Clodophora up there, right? So <laughs> I go into the Ridges Park or the beach, and uh, the guy's like, oh, look at this. It's so beautiful. There's no Clodophora here. What are you talking about? It's all sand. I said, why don't you just walk out to the water there for a little while? And he starts walking out, and you know how the Clodophora comes in, the sand kind of covers it over so it looks nice and pretty. And when he started sinking up to his, you know, halfway up his uh, calf, then he started realizing that maybe that wasn't sand he was sinking in. Um, and so now we realize, I think everybody's agreeing that the Clodophora doesn't look good. It's uh, maybe a, a risk to public health. Um, so the, the question is, what can we do with it? Or what, how do, what options do we have to get rid of it? The DNR has now streamlined sort of mechanical removal uh, processes. They'd always let you go in there with a rake um, and without a permit. Now the permitting process for mechanical removal is much, much easier. It's very cheap and inexpensive. Um, and in fact, Door County's Parks, I don't think George is here, they did a demo last summer um, at Whitefish Dunes and I think at Sunset. Um, and uh, they had a couple companies that were going to come. One actually made it. Um, and they actually went and tried to remove material uh, debris and things from the beach. This is another company. They're actually going to try this. I just got a hold of them last week. Um, they're going to try this unit this summer. But basically what it does is the bigger units like these either get dragged behind a tractor um, or this is actually the exact same unit that was here last summer. Um, and what it does is it just goes across the beach and it picks up any sort of litter and debris. Well, that's really great. We don't have the problems that California um, and some of the larger uh, urban areas have in terms of, you know, cigarette butts. And I mean, you'd be amazed at the stuff that comes up when these things pick up uh, the sand and, and filter it. Um, but so these are larger units. And so instead of just picking up those things, we want to know, would it pick up Clodophora? And we had a little dilemma because they got a permit to do this at Whitefish Dunes and the DNR was there and everything. And the guy driving it really didn't want to get a ticket and he was going to drive in the water. But then the DNR lady said, well, I won't look, don't worry. And so he kind of drove it along the shoreline and it actually worked pretty well for a really quick demo. Um, it picked up the Clodophora pretty well. And so that's great, but it's, un it's unlikely that anybody is going to uh, actually take one of these big units and just you know, have it at their you know, uh, private residence and then wheel it down to the, the beach. Um, there are smaller units. There's actually a smaller one I'll tell you about in a second. This one's a littler one that you just tow behind a four-wheeler and some municipalities have thought about buying one of these and basically what it would require is somebody to come out in the morning and go back and forth across the beach and grab the stuff before it really starts accumulating. There is one actually about the size of a rototiller um, and it, it's self-propelled. I don't know how well that would work for Clodophora, but the, the, uh, the, the pickup does two things. It removes all the material, so you get a nice beach like this that has no Clodophora down by the waterline. Um, the other thing it gives you is this right here. 
And so when you're doing this, you're getting the removal of the cladopher, and I'll talk about what you can do with that stuff in a minute. Um, and so by removing it, you're doing a couple things. It looks better, right? I mean, that's the obvious thing. But two, you're, you're decreasing that habitat for E. coli, other pathogens, and disease-causing organisms that may exist on your particular property. And so you're getting rid of that unsightliness, and you're also protecting sort of the water and, and uh, your own health. The other thing you can do is when you finish it, it grooms your beach. And this is an excellent picture of beach grooming. And you might think, well, it would be better if it was nice and flat and even. Well, in fact, from a health standpoint and from a uh, health of your sort of beach and shoreline, this is actually the way you want the machine to leave it. A little bit furled like that, it levels itself out. And if you walk out there, this is just, you know, a couple inches. Um, so it's really not a problem. But what that does, it provides aeration and cleansing and basically UV killing of other things that might have uh, come in contact with your beach sand. So the beach grooming and pickup. Um, is really the best sort of first step that you can do uh, in terms of removing things, whether it's a big unit like this, a small one. Um, we had people last year, we were up giving a talk up here about uh, removal options and things, and they were talking about a guy maybe uh, buying one of these units and going to homeowners associations and everybody would pay 100 bucks for the summer or whatever, and they would just go right down the beach and pick up all the material. Uh, some of the municipalities are thinking about doing that, and they've already had uh, homeowners adjacent to the beaches contact them about, you know, can we contribute if your person will come and clean it? And I have no idea what the parks department will do if they buy this. It's I, my understanding they, they intend to buy one. It's just sort of a matter of which one they do uh, actually purchase. And so maybe that'll be one of those that'll sort of rotate around the county. Um, but there's a lot of different sort of methods. And so, well, you know, getting this material off the beach is one problem. Uh, then what do you do with it is another one. And somebody said to me, they said, well, well, that's no big deal. Why don't you just haul it away? I'm like, well, that's pretty easy. If, you know, I mean, if you're the village of whatever, uh, you know, Egg Harbor or Ephraim or wherever, I mean, Ephraim would be really easy, right? You just haul it from here over to the road. It's <laughs> you know, about 20 feet. Um, but they, they have the dump trucks and everything. I mean, if you're a private homeowner, what are you going to do? I mean, you're not really going to want mechanical things driving through your lawn. And then how are you going to get it back up the hill? Um, and, uh, you know, um, there's a lot of sort of physical requirements that go along with that as well. So in order to decide what we could do with this cladophora, we wanted to look at is this potentially dangerous in any way to people using this. And I'm not going to go bore you with all of this. But basically what you're looking at here is all the things that any sort of uh, uh, reuse product in Wisconsin would go through, a testing to recycle things. And the take home message is there were no sort of toxic chemicals, metals, organic material, any of that stuff. I mean, I think it's fairly intuitive um, from where the cladophora comes from. Um, but again, we just wanted to make sure because actually in Milwaukee, some people looked at the cladophora that was coming out of the streams in Milwaukee. It was very high in heavy metals. And so those heavy metals would be a concern if you wanted to take this material out and then use it in your yard for vegetables or something. That would be problematic. In the case of anything we found uh, anywhere close to Door County, um, even Racine, uh, that's really not been a problem. The, the next thing uh, I wanted to look at was uh, looking at how well it burns. When you dry this stuff, has anybody ever tried drying it? It's, yeah, so it dries really kind of light and... Um, and so um, I have a, uh, some property up by Bailey's Harbor and, and we were sitting there and I had some of this laying out and my friends were like, what are you doing? Science people are so weird. And uh, I let it all dry out in the driveway and then when it was stuck there, I'm like, boy, this is really light. And we were having a campfire, I have two little girls and uh, we, they were roasting marshmallows and dad's roasting cladophora on the end of uh, the stick. And, but I noticed it actually burns pretty well. And so I'm like, wow, you know, I was envisioning retiring and making like those uh, fire starter logs out of cladophora. And uh, so that was going to be my whole money making thing. But anyway, so what we wanted to do is we went to Whitefish Dunes and, and uh, Lily Bay, Bailey's Harbor, Lakeside, and a bunch of different beaches and picked up cladophora. And this was just a couple times. And then we, we uh, sent it off to a company that determined how well it burns. And so this is a variety of uh, wood species. Um, you notice they're all about 6,300 BTUs. Uh, per pound. And so if you look at uh, Bailey's Harbor, I don't know maybe what they do to their, their cladophora, um, but generally the numbers we've had, these are pretty low. We don't usually find them that low. Um, it's mostly not cladophora, it's other types of algae, but um, it's somewhere between 55 and 6,500 BTUs. So it puts us pretty close to the range of most of these woods. Uh, this is BTU per pound. So, you know, if you look at things like 
ash and maple. Of course, they have different uh, densities and they burn hotter or colder. If you have a wood burner, you know that. But um, per pound of wood, they're pretty good. So this kind of led us to believe, well, maybe this actually uh, might work. They, in Canada, they make, has anybody seen those Java logs? Out of, they make out of coffee, uh, coffee grounds and the, the, the husks. And they actually sell them. I think they're like you know, all bean. They're like 20 bucks or something. Um, but they supposedly smell nice and whatever else. So <clears throat> I'll come back to this in a second. Um, the second alternative was, because I don't think anybody's going to go grab it off their beach and pelletize it or whatever, you could dry it and throw it in your uh, fire for your kids or grandkids, or you could uh, throw it in your wood burner for your house, but I, I don't think that's a realistic thing from, a, from an individual homeowner standpoint. So we wanted to look at, I mean, this is nice and green. It's nutrient-rich. That's one of the reasons that probably the E. coli uh, like it so much. What could we do with it? And so one of our collaborators, uh, Mary Seaman, uh, worked, at, uh, worked with the village of Ephraim and uh, set up some composting uh, sites or some composting bins. And I don't remember how many they had. I think about 12 of them. And, uh, and so these are just sort of a picture of some of those. And she took 100% Cladophora, half Cladophora, three quarters, you know, uh, Cladophora and so forth. Um, and so mix them with wood chips to see how they would compost. So if you're a homeowner, these are just cheap ones. You could have a nicer, kind of prettier looking compost bin. But could you compost them? And what kind of nutrients would it be good for your garden? Would the compost be worth anything? Um, and really, I'm not going to go, I've got tons of slides on this, but um, really what I want to show you is, so if you take the Cladophora ones, all Cladophora, and you started with 1,400 pounds of uh, Cladophora, um, at the end, you'd end up with only 800 pounds. You'd actually lose 600 pounds. And I know you're thinking, oh my goodness, how would I haul 1,400 pounds of Cladophora off my beach and put it in the compost bin? We're lucky. We have college students, so we can just make them do it. Um, <laughs> but anyway, you, you can have it at any size you want. But it just the, the take-home message, again, is the more you mix it with wood chips, the less the difference is. So the Cladophora really compost in terms of reducing mass it composts very well in terms of reducing the amount or the, the bulk you would have there. Um, and then we looked at phosphorus and nitrogen and so forth. Um, and I think I've got another one here. Here's a good one. So if you look at uh, you know, nitrogen, ammonia, nitrate, all these other things, again, the take-home message is Cladophora is very high in nitrogen. It's got a little bit of phosphorus in it, so it's not bad. But it really isn't uh, probably a big concern in terms of phosphorus contamination. It's got some nitrate and ammonia. Um, so really, it's a pretty good substrate for growing other plants. And so if you took the material, um, again, you know, here's sort of uh, phosphorus, available phosphorus. Um, so we don't want, I mean, we don't want a big phosphorus bomb that you're composting and every time it rains, you know, then you'd have all sorts of other issues on your property. Um, but the bottom line is it has good phosphorus, lots of nitrogen. It would be a great sort of soil amendment. It's a bulky material, um, so it helps drainage in, in clayish soils. Um, and then I got back onto my thermal log because I really wanted to retire. Um, well, I still do, but anyway, I keep buying lottery tickets and it just hasn't worked out for me. But anyway, um, so we, we looked at two different uh, ways of analysis. Uh, actually, this company called Renewal Fuel, there's several, you know, a biomass is a big thing now, using biomass for all sorts of things. Um, and in fact, our university right now is buying a $2 million digester. And they said, oh yeah, we've got 13,000 college students and they're here from September till May and they generate lots of waste and they're going to compost this. It's not composting, it's a anaerobic digestion and they're going to generate heat and um, electricity with it and about 10% of the entire campus's uh, heat and electrical load will be generated just from waste which I think is really interesting, but they said, well, we've got a problem because we've got 13,000 students that are here generating waste from September to May, and we have nothing from sort of May through August, and there's always sort of this delay, and I said, huh, well, gee, we got lots of Cladophora, maybe we could work out a deal and have them truck it from uh, some places, and actually, you know, Lake Winnebago, um, there's, no, there's, <laughs> there's no shortage of green things growing in that lake, um, so, you know, there's lots of opportunities, but, I mean, that's, we just went to Germany, this is a little side note, but a lot of people had things just like this Cladophora, and they were composting them on little farms in just uh, places that would be the size of this room. It was really fascinating. I mean, it's really a, an evolved technology there, but they would take like this waste, and farms would generate all their electricity and, and heat for the entire year. But anyway, so I digress. I went back to the BD, BTU thing again, and uh, basically what we found out was because of the nutrients, the nitrogen in the 
in the, uh, in the uh, cladophora, there's a lot of ash. And so if you're burning it, I mean, it produces some ash, so you're not going to want to use this in any sort of industrial boiler, right? Um, but it could be used to co-fire something. So if you dried it and burned it, or if you burn it at a campfire, I just figured how many tourists come up here and we could sell these logs and they'd be green and natural. Um, anyway, um, that's why I'm a scientist, not a business guy, I guess. But anyway, um, this, what's that? Oh, this sort of put us in the BTU range. We know they burn, and I think this summer I'm actually going to try and make one of these logs. Um, but we, this company said, you know, as far as they were concerned from a bulk market perspective, it would be a good coal-firing product, but probably not the thing that you're going to want to rely on to heat, you know, uh, the, the county building or uh, some large municipal building. Um, but it could be used to augment some other heat sources. So, um, again, uh, this is just what I mentioned, maybe used for home or some small municipal composting systems. Um, if you have uh, a mixture with a little bit of, of wood, maybe that works, but the larger amount of cladophora, the better it, it, it composts. Lots of nitrogen in there, um, you know, potassium and phosphorus uh, doesn't really change much, saying basically that that's uh, uh, not being removed in the process. Um, and again, it may be able to be used as sort of a secondary combustible material um, if you have something else that's uh, uh, used as a primary material. Um, and then so some of the conclusions, um, and I'll kind of scroll, th whoops, I'll scroll through these so we don't have to kind of keep clicking away, is that again, the E. coli is higher in the cladophora mat. The longer it sits on your beach or wherever it happens to be, the probability that the, the E. coli is increasing in number both within the mat and in the water adjacent to the mat, if you're using that, um, increases. So you want to get the material off your beach um, as soon as you possibly can. Uh, we don't find any pathogens, so maybe you know, the exact risk to public health by leaving it there, aside from being unsightly, we don't really know, but we know pro it, the, the data suggests that preferentially E. coli is growing relative to the pathogens, uh, causing some doubt on its use as an indicator. Um, and again, uh, we know from other experiments uh, that you know, whether it's composting or, or, or combustion, there are things you can do with the material if you can get it off uh, and out of the water. The stuff that comes up your beach and is stranded is a little bit easier. It's the stuff sort of floating in that swash zone that makes it sort of problematic. And so, um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of things that we did. And so all our partners, the Soil and Water and Health Department, um, you know, of course, somebody has to pay for all this um, and so forth. So with that, I guess, um, hopefully we didn't go too, too long. And uh, we thank you for, for coming. And we'd be happy to answer any questions either now or I think Coggins... Uh, got us some refreshments and so we're going to be around for a little while so any way that people want I mean we're here to answer questions I mean it doesn't have to be just about this it can be about anything the meaning of life or what thank you Oh yeah, a lot in in the cladophora itself, or well, in, in the, the beaches. Water, in the, in the yeah, lots of it. it. So a lot of the beaches. I mean, again, and this is a, this is not part of this talk exactly, but since we do the monitoring, um, the the beaches in Door County are in great shape. <laughs> I mean, we find lots of zeros, one. I mean, a, a lot of that, and so by and large, there's not a lot of problems. It's the, it's the occasional, as Colleen said, you know, you'll get a high day one day, um, and then uh, the next day it'll go back down. And so um, most of the beaches average really low numbers. And so those high days are really uh, not the norm. They're sort of atypical. In other places in the Great Lakes, it's very common for beaches to be closed for 30 days because the numbers have stayed up that long. So even though the Green Bay TV stations want you to think that the beaches are horrible in Door County, it isn't true. I think one of you mentioned that uh, the Guadalajara wasn't so bad if it was out in the, the main part of the water, as long as it wasn't concentrated on the beach. What about the idea of just taking it off the beach, getting it out there, you know, with, with a boat or something, getting it out to where it can distribute and then it seems less concentrated. Uh, that, that's that a, work or not 
Uh, I've never actually tried that. Um, that I don't know. Frankly, that's the first time anybody suggested that. Um, really, the problem would be nearshore. So, I mean, if, if you look from aerial satellite views, you can see huge masses of this cladophora sort of floating over toward Michigan. And if you've ever been in the Sleeping Bear Dunes, most of their shoreline is very sandy. And so Cladophora requires a rocky shoreline. I always think about, you know, if you go north of Whitefish Dunes or Bailey's Harbor, those, you know, all those rocks kind of out are probably where it's coming from there. Um, and so when it detaches, it's just windage, which way it goes. So if you pulled it out, um, as long as it didn't go out and kind of come back in like on your neighbor's yard, um, <laughs> then it might be a good way to get rid of some of it. Well, what if that gets broken up in the process? It does. That is, you could, you're running vessels through it or something like that, churning it up so it's not such large. Yeah, and, and one of the things to keep in mind, we say cladophora, and at some beaches like Whitefish Dunes, it's predominantly cladophora, so it's very stringy and it you know, kind of holds together. Um, some other beaches, Lakeside's a good example. A lot of that is a, a other sort of macrophytes, you know, things that don't hold together. So if you pulled them out, it would just sort of dissipate and, and, and sink over time. I, I don't know, that would be an interesting, uh, interesting thing to try. Maybe you could get a, you know, put a sweeper on the beach and just pull it out with your boat. I, <laughs> One year, game. We, one year we had the idea that we would actually um, try to find out where these mats went. We were trying to figure out a way to put some kind of radio tracer in the mat so that we could follow, you know, when it leaves the beach, where does it go? Does it come back down by your neighbor or does it dissipate out in the lake? And we never figured out a way to get our well, radio tracer back. So. Well, yeah, and we wanted to find out where it came from. Right. <laughs> so that's where, well, where's this cladophora coming from? Where, you know, where's the cladophora on my beach coming from? And uh, so the idea was to go out and where it's growing. You can see it with scuba gear on and uh, somehow label it, and then you can see how it moves. But it's really current and windage uh, driven. Um, but we do know the cladophora that grows out in the lake or you see out there has much, much less E. coli than anything you find on shore. So it's that sort of interaction between it coming in and something that's happening on the shore, birds or whatever, um, that's causing that sort of, you know, increase in numbers. I believe all this effort uh, was motivated by a group of swimmers at Nicolay Bay that became ill. What was the argument that was E. coli too, and yeah, I mean that is that is a, sort of true. Coincidentally, the Nicolay Bay incident occurred in 2002, and the Beach Act, which really started the county monitoring and all the coastal, was passed in 2000. Well, pa started in 2003, so it was just coincidence that those two events happened. But but the thing that yeah, but the thing it seems like it was about because of that, and uh, but the the same thing they found at Nicolay Bay. The E. coli is the same thing that the county, the health department monitors, or we help the health department monitor for all summer, every summer. So it's the exact same thing. E. coli didn't cause the illness, did it? No, not. What was it? It was a variety of things that yeah. they found. They found um, cryptosporidium. They found campylobacter. I mean, they found a bunch of stuff. So it was a fecal input that made those people sick. Why would it have well, that's a point of debate. There is, there, you could contact the health department. I, they do have a report on that. Um, there were other things that were there. I mean, it was obvious that there was a problem. I mean, there were uh, hygiene products <laughs> on, on the beach and, and toilet paper and things. Um, and so at the time, and so where it came from, there's a little bit of a, you know, I, I think uh, people have different ideas of where exactly it came from, but um, someplace near shore, probably. The cladophora? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I could use thousands of tons, but <laughs> I haven't been able to get a hold of it. Really? That seems shocking. <laughs> we, the stuff actually, the, 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 the cladophora that was used there in Ephraim, we had to get from Bailey's Harbor. And I know the woman who owns the beachfront there is just, uh, anybody that wants to come grab a cup full of it, just come take what you want because they want to get it off their beach. And so my, you know, if somebody like that, we, we suggested that we were talking about actually Little Lake in Sturgeon Bay and what can they do with all the macrophytes that grow in there. And there are other places that use it as exactly what you're saying. They'll either use it as a soil amendment or a com they'll compost it and then they'll put it somewhere else. Little Lake has other issues because it has metals and things that are associated with it. This stuff is clean. 
um, and it's a good bulking material. So if you have a clay, you know, poor draining soil, this would really help it out. So um, I don't know. I don't know if the county, I mean, that's a good, good point. I mean, if municipalities want to get rid of this stuff, um, you know, they should <laughs> make it available. But the biggest problem is getting it off the beach. And so until you mechanically get a way to do that, it's really difficult to get enough of it to do anything with. That, well, there you go. See, uh, I, I know Ephraim, I think Mary told me, Ephraim was putting in a big pad and they were going to look at mechanical removal there. I know they're not the only beach. I know uh, Bailey's Harbor is really uh, concerned. Um, there's the uh, city of Sturgeon Bay. So I would guess if somebody called around, they could, you know, if somebody knew they wanted it, somebody would find a way to get it to you. <laughs> I don't know. When you uh, composted, did the compost get hot enough to kill the E. coli, or were you able to measure E. coli after you or during the composting process? That really wasn't part of the, the composting study. The person who did the composting study wasn't one of us, really, and, and so no, that wasn't something that we looked at, although I wouldn't necessarily be real concerned with that. Um, it would be easy enough to try and test out, and if anybody wants to try doing Clodophora in their compost bin or just try it this summer, um, while our students are here, if they want to bring a sample of it in, we'll be happy to test it before and after for you. But as we mentioned, um, if you look at composting quality or biosolids quality, um, you know, whether it's A, B, or exceptional quality, or whatever classification you want, it's based on the amount of pathogens. And, uh, and because we're not finding that in the Clodophora, that really leads us to believe that you know, probably that's not a big concern because E. coli actually we detect, and anytime you detect it in beach water, it's non-pathogenic. 99.999% of the time, um, there are pathogenic E. coli, but in fact, those don't show up on the typical tests. So it's, it's a little bit, you know, uh, and we do have temperature. She has temperature yeah, measurements for all of the compostings, and they did get high enough that it should kill pathogens. She didn't look for the pathogens. Yeah. It does get pretty warm. No, <laughs> there's no test strips to test the you mean the water like the beach water. No, there are um, there are some volunteer groups that use these little things called petri films, and they'll put a a, a thing uh, a drop of water. They're not really made for that application. They're made for food testing. Um, what we generally suggest is if somebody wants their water tested, maybe we can work out a deal with Coggin to sort of advertise this. You know, we, we don't want to do hundreds of thousands of tests, but there are homeowners associations and individual citizens every year that come in and say, hey, I'd like just what you're saying. Periodically, I'd like to test my water. You know, could somebody run it? I mean, we're here doing it anyway. We would just do it for you, you know, at no cost. And so that's really not, I mean, we kind of look at that as a service we can do for people in the county. Um, so, I mean, if you brought in 100 every week, we might have to talk. Um, but, you know, that would be something that would be pretty easy um, to work out. And the people are here pretty much Monday through Friday. Um, and if not, just get a hold of one of us and we can put you in touch with them. And they'll, they'll get you a sample bottle and all the instructions. And, you know, if you're on one, I mean, they sample 30 beaches in the county. So if you're on the way, they, it's probably just easier if they swing in and pick it up or whatever. Right. We, for several years, we d had a deal with uh, Bayshore property owners, and they brought, they had citizens collecting the samples and then brought it to us, and it, it wasn't free. But um, <laughs> well, not for them. But it, <laughs> we had we were a doing lot a samples. lot of samples. Um, they haven't done it in the last couple of years, but yeah, we would give training on how to take the samples. Yeah, we've never really given out the kits. It's pretty simple. I figured it out, so um, you know most people can do it. We would tell you how to do that kind of stuff, but we haven't actually sent kits out you know, to a lot of people. Any other questions? Or? Is there any long-term uh, modeling as to is this going to get worse or is the lake going to get a little higher? Well, yeah, you notice this year the lake levels went back up and a lot of the Clodophora disappeared. <laughs> um, no, nobody can say that that really is the cause, but if you look at the last time the Clodophora was at its maximum on the shoreline, the water level was the lowest. And so um, the theory is, as Colleen mentioned, there's a couple factors at play. The phosphorus levels really haven't changed a lot. 
Um, they're certainly a contributor. This is, this is my feeling. I mean, I don't think anybody knows this for sure. But then if you look at the mussels that have sort of cleared the water, I mean, it's very clear now, I mean, which is, seems great. But when you have clearer water and then the water level drops, then you have more of that rocky substrate that's available for growth. So instead of having you know, a, a thing the size of maybe the top of this laptop to grow on, they've got the size of that table to grow on. So it's just more surface area for growth. As the water level increases, the level which the light penetrates the water you know, kind of moves in and then the amount that's available to grow decreases. I, you know, it's just one year, but I thought it was very interesting last year as the, I mean, because the water level went up substantially and the amount of Clodophora was way down, um, almost everywhere. Um, so I don't know, we can always hope the water goes back up and then, it, then you know, we're done with our project, so we'd be happy to be out of business. Um. Any thought on what uh, Milwaukee with opening their gates sewage system a couple times a summer have to do with it? That would have nothing to do with the E. coli that's here. I know that um, several times we've, we've talked to people about uh, you know, uh, Menominee, Michigan and their wastewater treatment plant and things coming across. The, 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 the distance is so great from Milwaukee to here and the amount of the water in between is so great. It would have, it, it, it's, uh, it's like putting a drop of, or, you know, one red grain of sand in your entire sandbox and then trying to find it again. Um, you would just, it was just so infinitesimal. Um, so yeah, I don't think that really would have much to do with it. Now, if you live closer to Milwaukee, there would be a problem. You know, the sort of old, old engineering adage was the solution to pollution was dilution. Um, so. And, I, and Milwaukee's done those studies. They've looked yeah. at like the plumes of the sewage, and they've looked. They've gone out and measured E. coli, and it doesn't get past the mouth of the harbor. And we've we've done studies here, because when we first came, everyone said, "Yeah, it can't. It comes from Chicago. It comes from Menominee, Michigan, someplace. It's not our problem." It's just the people from Chicago. And, no, I'm just and we, uh, but we did all the spatial sampling and. The highest levels are close to shore, and there's almost nothing as you go out further. So it's coming from the shore into the water. Yeah, and we've done that at many beaches in Door County. And the thing, the nice thing with Door County is now there's so much data that exists on all these beaches that we know this is sort of a shoreline phenomenon. And the Soil Water Department has went through a bunch of the beaches, and, and they're being redesigned. And I think that'll really make a big difference once they all get done. Um, but it's really things that you can do something about. You know, I mean, the Milwaukee thing, it'd be hard for people to do anything about. So at least the good news is it's something close by. And as I mentioned, it's, it's not good that it's here, but it's, the problem here is so much smaller than anywhere else. The problem is, you know, the, the, maybe the tolerance is less here. You know, everybody's used to a certain way that they like things, which I think is a good thing. Um, so, you, you know, you don't want any. So you're trying, you're trying to reduce this to this instead of reducing this to this. And so, yeah, um, but we know that it's a local phenomenon. And because there's so much data, if you get a boat discharging or some other problem, that shows up like that. I mean, it's, it's really obvious when something's not normal. Um, so it would be caught much quicker. And in the case of the Nicolay Bay, um, if, the, if the monitoring program existed today, like it does today in the county, and that same event had occurred, it's likely that about half the people that got sick would not have gotten sick because the, the testing would have caught it. And right now we have a little delay in the testing. We hope, our plan is to hopefully build some infrastructure in the county where in a couple of years we'll have rapid testing. So you can do your beach testing at eight in the morning and the, the results are done by 10. So if there's a problem, you'll be able to open and close the beach within the same day. And so if you're a business owner or municipal, uh, somebody in the municipality, the beach is not closed more than it has to be. It's, op it's back open right away, which is a good thing. And when it's closed, it really should be closed. And so that's, we think that's really going to be a, an advantage, too. I saw a presentation here in this room uh, some time ago showing that the nutrients coming down the Fox River came around the peninsula and back down the lake side. And uh, that I, I believe that, that presentation of a fairly large percentage of the nutrients came from that source. Um, not just from the immediate shoreline out. Yep. Yeah, the, the, it's probably the phosphorus. The Fox River, I don't know, but it's probably Vicki Harris, or I don't know, maybe Coggy knows who was here at the time, but there, the Fox River is the biggest phosphorus discharger into Lake Michigan. It is. I mean, there's no, I mean, yeah. and uh, so that is clearly the case. And so from a phosphorus standpoint, that phosphorus isn't necessarily, the phosphorus isn't necessarily what's coming from your yard. 
Um, when we're saying that the, the pollution is coming from near shore, we're talking E. coli. Um, so the E. coli, Feces. yeah, the fecal material, the things that we're testing for in terms of beach monitoring, um, that E. coli is coming from shore. But you're right, the phosphorus is, that's absolutely right. You can watch it come right up, you know, uh, Green Bay around the peninsula back down. Um, and that, you know, uh, it's much lower than it used to be, but it's still, Wisconsin's still contributing the largest amount. side of the map was always significantly higher than the right side. You didn't say it was at, significantly at, at Whitefish it is. At Newport and Lakeside it, they were not significantly different. And it, we think it's longshore current. It's just pushing That's it the, north from the mat rather than south. One of the big concerns we always had was, you know, with the current moving the material out of the mat, is that if you notice those mats will come in and the wind changes and then they'll just all of a sudden disappear. And so, you know, if the, the wind changes at four in the morning and all of a sudden the mat disappears and you decide, oh, it looks like a beautiful day, I want to go swimming, did as the mat leave your beach, did it leave some sort of, like I always call it, microbial carnage behind in its wake um, that you really can't see, but when you go out and you want to jump into it, um, I don't know, that's something we didn't look at as part of this study, but I think it's, it's worthwhile looking at, you know, as the things move. Um, my hope is hopefully, you know, <laughs> what was pointed out, hopefully we'll, this will go away and we'll, we'll know more about Clodoffer, but it won't be a problem anymore. Any other questions? All right, thank you again. Thank you.